house when the hydro blows in. Well, yeah, you're going to light a candle. For, for the longest time, uh, it would depend for us on the weather. <laughs> because oftentimes, if the hydro goes out, there's a chance it's raining. And if it threatens rain at our house, there is a waterfall coming into the sump hole. And if the power goes out, we would often find ourselves bailing, but the board has taken care of that problem. Thanks be to God. And if it's daytime, there's no water in the sump, sometimes we'll uh, go out and do something where there's power. <laughs> or if I'm at work, I'll just work on my computer until the battery gets dangerously low and I need to stop. But if it's nighttime, I'll go hunting for a flashlight. And then oftentimes you find out the real reason you have a baby toe, <laughs> which is to find misplaced furniture in the dark. Sometimes we play board games with candles. One time when we lived in Bruce County, Diana knows what this story is going to be. Uh, we, it was before we owned a barbecue and the power was out and we were just about to make supper. So we had no hydro to do anything, electric stove, the whole bit. Uh, so we uh, roasted wieners by candlelight. <laughs> and I don't think that's terribly romantic. And I don't recommend you do it unless you're fond of the taste of paraffin. Well, if it's getting close to bedtime, I tend to pray for the power to come back on because if I don't have hydro, I don't see it because I, this is too much information, I know. I use a continuous positive airway pressure machine at night and I have for almost 25 years. And if I don't have that thing, my body simply won't go to sleep. Uh, so a, a couple of years ago, I went and bought one of these, sorry for the technical terminology, doohickeys, um, that has enough juice to jumpstart a battery but conveniently also has a 12 volt socket in it and with a modest inverter, that will power my CPAP machine for most of the night. So we're, we're set. More information than you want. I mean. But I think all this demonstrates, because you're not going to be much different from me, uh, it, that we in Western society have a real dependence on the constant supply of hydroelectric power and particularly light. I mean, if you're like me, uh, even when the hydro's off, you instinctively, you walk into a room that's dark, you turn the light on, and then you realize, oh, that didn't work, and you turn it back off. Or sometimes you forget, like I do, and then when the hydro comes back on, your house is lit up like a Christmas tree. Well, speaking of Christmas, here we are in the first, se first Sunday of the season of Advent, a word that means coming. It's a four-week season of preparation at the beginning of the Christian year for the coming of Jesus. And I, I had a conversation with somebody the other day. What is Advent and how do you prepare for the coming of Jesus? Well, we are a people of a story. And so recounting the story, remembering, is a way that we can ready ourselves for something that we know is going to happen, right? Because we know Jesus is going to be born. That's, that's not going to surprise most people, but it builds the anticipation and helps us get ready. And while some churches will focus on the theme of hope today, we're going to focus on the theme of light, because that's what Jesus does in the passage where we find ourselves in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. Last time we visited John's Gospel, we looked at the story of the woman caught in adultery, a, a story that was kind of inserted into the saga of Jesus' visit to the temple in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And as we pick up in verse 12, his discourse continues there. See, at the end of chapter 7, he said that he is the source of living water in a dry season. And now he's going to make another claim for himself. This is John 8. 12 to 20. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. Now this is the second of the I am sayings here, right? One with a predicate significant again, because just as Jesus talked about being living water in a dry season, now he's talking about being light at a time when we're getting close to the uh, 
autumnal equinox. So it's getting around the time when daylight is becoming scarcer. We understand this today. And he says, it's getting dark out, but I am the light of the world. And he says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees replied, you are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Now, they were following the law that said you had to have anything backed up with two or three witnesses. But they had forgotten that they'd had a similar debate with Jesus that was recorded back in chapter 5. The witnesses that Jesus talked about there were John the Baptist in verse 33, miracles in verse 36, the Father in verse 37, and the scriptures in verse 39. So there already had been witnesses noted. Jesus told them, these claims are valid, even though I make them about myself. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards. But I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect, because I am not alone. Jesus doesn't condemn here, right? He provokes judgment. And there's also the matter of the difference between divine and worldly judgment. But remember back in chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said that we should look beneath the surface so that we can judge correctly. Not as the world judges, but to judge correctly. Or we can look ahead to chapter 9, verse 39, where Jesus says that he has come to the world to render judgment. That is divine judgment. And then there's the Apostle Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, where he says that we don't look upon others from a human point of view. So Jesus can judge because he has God's perspective. We instead discern and act accordingly. All right. The Father who sent me is with me. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. I am one witness, and my Father who sent me is the other. Where is your Father? they asked. Jesus answered, Since you don't know who I am, you don't know who my Father is. If you knew me, you would also know my Father. Jesus made these statements while he was teaching in the section of the temple known as the treasury. But he was not arrested because his time had not yet come. Why does that location matter? Why is it significant that John said, oh, by the way, here's where Jesus had this little conversation? Well, let me tell you. The treasury is part of the court of women in the temple. Uh, women couldn't do much in the temple. You know, that was the way the culture worked. Uh, but they could give offerings. Isn't that great? You know, or convenient? Uh, but anyway, in this, uh, in this area where women were permitted uh, and where offerings were received, there were as many as 16 golden bowls put up on posts that were used for a light ceremony in the Feast of Tabernacles. And these bowls were perched up high and filled with oil, and the wicks they used were the worn undergarments of the priests. And to think that I just use mine for dust rags. <laughs> These bowls were lit up at night so during the festival. And so it said that all Jerusalem was illumined by these lights. In a time when there was no public street lamps or anything like that, this was a big deal. And when these lights were lit, there was much rejoicing. That's a Monty Python reference. Uh, the people saw this as a sign that their Messiah would come to bring them light. Assuming Jesus was teaching at this point on the day after the Feast of, Feast of Tabernacles was done, those bowls would still be up there, but their oil and their gitch wicks would be spent. The symbolism would still be there when Jesus stood up and said, I am the light of the world. Surrounded by these bowls, that had illumined Jerusalem, that are now spent, Jesus says, I am the light, not just of Jerusalem, but of the world. 
In many ways, what Jesus said about living water in chapter 7 and about being the light of the world here in chapter 8 begin the fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah was one of the Old Testament prophets. And this uh, section from chapter 14 of Zechariah begins to come to fulfillment when Jesus comes, and it will be fulfilled upon his return. Listen to this. This is Zechariah 14, 6-9. On that day, the sources of light will no longer shine, yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this could happen. There will be no normal day and night, for at evening time it will still be light. On that day, life-giving waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth, on that day there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. The time is coming when Jesus alone will be worshipped. He will return. We will never thirst again. We will never need artificial light to be able to see clearly. Light is a theme in many traditions, but in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it usually describes the saving work of God. John gets this because he uses the term light for Jesus 16 times in the gospel and then on top of that in the letters later on. And after all, of course, God's first act in creation is what? Let there be light. And it was a pillar of fire that guided the Israelites through the wilderness. It was a pillar of light. Psalm 27, verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 119, verse 105 says that God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. So Jesus is the fundamental source of the world's illumination. If you're following along in your notes, that's the blank, the first one. Jesus is the fundamental source of the world's illumination. See, light is not a natural possession, right? We are at light's mercy in some respect because it comes with the rising of the sun and it goes with the setting of the sun and any other light beyond that or the moon on a particularly bright night is, is artificial. We have created it on our own by God's grace. And because Jesus is light, his followers are lights, because he lives in us by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 5, 14, Jesus reiterates this when he tells the followers that you are the light of the world. So you have a choice. You can be like a hurricane lamp or a bushel basket. One displays the light, the other hides it. I, don't miss this. Lots of people think because they're afraid that they can't be a bright enough light that they should just hide their light under a bushel. Don't do that. Don't do that. It takes very little light to dispel a lot of darkness. I have in my hand a very tiny oil lamp. This belonged to one of my great-grandmothers. I'm not sure which one I can't recall at the moment. But it amazes me that something like this was even created, let alone preserved, because it seems so strange that something so tiny could produce any amount of light that would be significant enough to use. But apparently it did. Because it takes very little light to dispel a lot of darkness. Very little light. And if that little light would produce something productive, imagine what you can do with the light of Jesus Christ that is within you. Think about it. What often characterizes this season? These are in your notes as well if you want to follow along. Feeling compelled to attend events you'd rather not attend. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Oh, another party for work. Yay. <laughs> How about this? Deeper indebtedness. There's, there's so much social pressure to buy, 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 buy. 
either to buy love or buy happiness or keep up with the Joneses or something. And often there is a depression that can stem from that compulsion to attend events or the pressure to spend money you don't have, as well as remembering lost loved ones and a growing lack of daylight. So ironically, a season that is supposed to be full of light for many people is a season of great darkness. I think it's one of the reasons people put up Christmas lights and go drive around town to look at them. Was that something you did? I know when I was a kid, my parents loved to do that. Our parents love us to take them around and see Christmas lights. Uh, people just want to see light. So what it boils down to, I think, is this. Your job, my job as a follower of Jesus, is to bring Jesus' light into the world's darkness. To bring Jesus' light into the world's darkness. And how do we do that? Well, I actually make some suggestions for you on the connection card. We're wrapping two things in one here. We're actually getting the connection card and the application all in the same place. You can uh, tear off the connection card. This isn't just for guests. This is for everybody. Tear off the connection card. You can give this to me. You can leave it in the basket at the connection desk on your way to coffee. Uh, but there may be some steps you'll want to take as a result of the message this morning. How can you bring Jesus' light into the darkness? Well, one way is by sending Christian Christmas cards. There'll be some people who think, well, duh, it's Christmas. But there's a lot of ridiculously generic or terribly secular Christmas cards out there. And what I'm suggesting is that let, let other people use those. You use Christmas cards that say something about Jesus, whatever that may be. It doesn't have to be in your face, but it, it should be something, you know, at least that says Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays. Uh, you know, don't worry about the Santas and the snowmen. Let's focus on the manger scenes and Jesus. Maybe write a note in them that expresses your joy at the gift that Jesus is to us. So if you'll bring the light of Jesus into the darkness of the world simply by sending intentionally Christian Christmas cards, do that. Check that off. And pray that Canada Post brings down the cost of postage. <laughs> the second thing you can do is you can bring Jesus' light into the darkness by avoiding unnecessary commercialism. Let's face it, the social pressure to spend, spend, spend is undeniable. It runs all year, but it really ramps up around Black Friday, right? And then Cyber Monday. You thought the deals on Black Friday were great. Look at the deals on Cyber Monday. And then what happens is it transitions absolutely seamlessly into Christmas. And for the whole month of December, we are bombarded if you have a television in your house or a radio or any other form of communication, you will find that we are bombarded with advertising that expects us to spend more and more and more. So often presents piled high under the tree are not celebrations of the greatest gift of all, but are a feeble attempt to make up for time not spent together or sins committed or a lack of popularity. To be sure, giving gifts as the wise men did for Jesus is a wonderful way to express our appreciation for other people and to symbolize the gift of salvation that is Jesus Christ, but it doesn't need to go over the top. Some people, instead of buying something for the person who has everything, will make a charitable donation in that person's name, which, by the way, you can do for the Christmas offering if you want to. There are some Honor gift cards that are sitting on the connection desk. If you want to make a gift to the Christmas offering in honor of somebody, you can do that today. So if you'll bring uh, Jesus' light by avoiding unnecessary commercialism, then check that off. Or here's another thought. You can bring Jesus' light into the darkness by inviting friends to Christmas services and events. The postcard that's in your bulletin today, this is not intended for you. It's information, but you can write this in your calendar. The idea is to give this to a friend. 
Maybe you have a friend or a family member, a loved one, who finds this a dark time of year. And this may be an occasion by giving them this and inviting them, maybe even offering to pick up the person and bring them with you, might bring some light into an otherwise dark season for them. It'll give them the joy of Jesus. It'll give them some community to help them through the season. If you'd like more than one of these, there's a stack of them at the connection desk. If you want to share it on social media, it's on our Facebook page. You can always get at it that way. Or if you want the original, the email to somebody, just email me and I'll gladly send you the original. And be intentional about who you give them to. Ask the Lord to show you the best person to give it to within your own circle of acquaintance. The person may just come to the carol sing or just come to Christmas Eve, but even a guest who comes to one of those events might have some light brought into their darkness by you sharing your light of Jesus. So if you'll do that, check that off. Or maybe, if you're honest with yourself, you feel like you are in a dark place and you've never felt the warmth of Jesus' light in your own soul. Now is the time to check off I want Jesus' light to flood my darkness. Help me begin a personal relationship with Jesus. If that's what you'd like, check that off. Let me help you grow into a relationship that will change your life forever. Does that mean you never feel darkness again? No. But it does mean you will have a light to look to Whenever you see that darkness coming in, Jesus will help you by his spirit to weather whatever storm that is. There's a video I'd like you to have a look at. In the beginning, darkness covered the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. The true light, which gives light to everyone, came into the world. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. It is a light for the lost, the searching and the seeking. A light for the darkest valley. A light to drive out fear, even in the shadow of death. When we believe in the light, we become children of the light. It shines in us, through us. If we walk in the light, if we let it shine before others, we become a city on a hill. The light of the world. When we let his word light our path, Others will follow. We become a beacon of hope to a world in darkness. Our lives reflect the glory of his resurrection. He makes us a light for the nations, so his salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Let there be light. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Let's pray. Truly, Father, you have given us the greatest gift of all in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to be his light bearers in the world, to walk as children of light. We pray for those yet in darkness, for whatever reason. And ask for your spirit to empower us to be able to share your light with them, to draw them out of darkness and into your wonderful, marvelous light. <clears throat> at this time of year, we know that people are more open to you than at any other time of year, and we ask that you will give us grace to be good stewards of that reality. Use us as people who were walking in darkness and have seen your great light to show the wonder of the world, that is Jesus. To show the world that unto us a son is given, 
who is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our Prince of Peace. Amen. We will sing, stand to sing, let all mortal flesh keep silence as we await the boys and girls in our time at the communion table. 